Hello, welcome. Um, this is our uh, continuing series on the uh, hiring process and sort of HR and QA relationships. Um, and this webinar is being put on by Cowerman Consulting in conjunction with Mantech. Um, and with that said, as we've done before, I wanted to give a quick opportunity for Evan Bates of Mantech to introduce himself and what they do. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, just a real quick overview kind of what Mantech is. Mantech is a part of the MEP uh, system that is funded by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, we are a resource center along with our sister centers all over the United States. Uh, we are here to assist manufacturers with everything from sales and marketing all the way through process control or process improvements, uh, workforce engagement, um, and also automation and technology. Um, if you are in the South Central Pennsylvania region and you need help with anything that has to do with manufacturing, we uh, invite you to contact us. We are your free resource to be of assistance to you to help you grow. Um, and if you're not located in South Central Pennsylvania, that's totally fine. There's MAMIP centers all over the United States. Um, and if you need help getting in contact with, with one of your local centers, uh, just shoot me an email and I'll be happy to put you in contact with them. And we huge thanks to uh, Brian and the, and the Kellerman Consulting team. Um, the past two of these webinars has been fantastic. I've learned a lot, um, and I hope you guys uh, learned a lot as well in those last two, and I look forward to today. So thanks to the Kellerman team. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Thanks. Thanks again, Evan. I do want to, as I have in the previous two webinars, shout out to the MEPs all over the country. They are really awesome organizations. Uh, they are uh, positive entities and they can be very, very helpful for businesses that are looking for some support and guidance um, and assistance with some of these uh, challenging manufacturing concepts. Okay, so with that said, in our previous webinars, we looked at, if you want to think about it thematically, um, in terms of going from the beginning of the hiring process and sending out resumes for people and then what does it mean to either elevate or hire someone in QA. We're moving on into now um, a, a topic of, of sort of defining what quality assurance roles really are. We are going to talk about quality assurance just from a technical standpoint where a QA tech or and I'm going to talk about quality assurance, but a QA, a QC quality control can be somewhat of a, a part of that process. I know they, they may be slightly different, but we, we think of them similarly. Um, we do have uh, a view of food safety, but we're also going to talk about broad industrial QA. They're, they're similar. Um, we're going to look at the manager level and director level and we're going to also sort of get into what is QA as far as a collection of tasks or jobs that a person or a series of people may have. Because at the end of the day, what I want everybody listening to this to think about is uh, whatever your concept of quality assurance is or a person who would be QA, that's something you're making up. That's There isn't really a definition of quality assurance. There are quality assurance departments. There are QA managers. Quality assurance is a, an absolutely essential function in a properly run business. But to actually wrap our arms around or try to uh, limit it to a definition is not really a thing. Quality assurance is a collection of many tasks. And it's a collection of many possible approaches that can be done by any number of people in a business. And so as we talk about what it means to have a QA role or uh, whether it's a hierarchy as far as management or directors, we are going to try to build up uh, a very flexible approach to that. And my hope for, for the folks that are here live with me, anyone watching after the fact, is that it really helps recontextualize in your minds, potentially in your own business, what it means to actually assign someone the role of QA and, and, and what are the expectations you have of them and how are they going to fit into the larger business? Does that work? Does it need to be changed? Within that, these are the, the topics we're going to look at. So we are going to look at the responsibilities for food safety as far as food safety, uh, as food factories go, quality assurance in both for the food factories and for industrial, how to set up the position, um, and how to mix the sort of um, 
tasks within the definition of, of what a normal job would look like or a series of jobs. Um, and we're going to talk about scheduling and meetings. We actually break it up later in this presentation between scheduled activities and the ki kinds of meetings that people have to have. Again, thinking through the net amount of hours it takes to actually get a job like this done. Um, one of the main points that we're going to touch on, though, is that you have one or more people with a defined number of hours that they can be working in a normal job. And we have the tasks that need to get done, some of which are either, you know, can add up to greater than that amount of work or less. And it very much is dependent on how you define quality assurance and what collection of tasks go along with that. So with that as an introduction, let's let's start with what are the main roles that someone in quality assurance is going to have. So here we're going to I want everyone to start with the thought process of are we talking about a quality assurance technician or are we talking about a quality assurance manager? Are we talking about folks that are elsewhere in the business and have just been given these tasks? And I want to be very clear about this. I do not think that there is, as I mentioned, I don't think that there really is a fixed definition of quality assurance and each business does it differently. And, you know, the, the funny thing as uh, someone in my, in my role that works with so many businesses is that quality assurance people think they know what quality assurance is because they know their job within one company. And the fact is, is that it is wildly different from business to business. And people don't realize just how much flexibility there is in a definition for this. So the, but when we talk about quality assurance or so, but whatever, um, we are going to start with the concept of a main role might be the leader of the food safety or quality program. Now, that is an obvious place where maybe many of you have, are starting to think about when you think about QA, well, they run the quality assurance program. That's not necessarily the case. The quality assurance person can run the quality program. However, if uh, if we're talking about a very small business and the owner or the person who starts the business wants to take responsibility for quality assurance themselves, and I can tell you that we have clients that that is uh, something that is done and it can be done very successfully. The person running the business can also be the person in charge of quality in which case that role is not a quality assurance manager necessarily, but the people who do quality are going to work directly with ownership. You can also have plant managers, people who are in operations that have quality or food safety responsibilities tacked on in a small manner, in which case there may not be a dedicated quality assurance department. Um, to go along with that role, though, we also have here the second bullet point is the creator or man, uh, of the of the program. Well, depending on the life cycle of your business, the first two bullet points may go together. The person who creates the program may also be the person who runs it. That would be a classic, easy to understand relationship. I've started a business. I brought in somebody who had previous experience. They built my program for me, and I was able to immediately say, you now have this responsibility. Where that happens, it's a little easier to define what quality assurance is, and that is a classic way. So that person is going to have all the policies and procedures that are needed to start up equipment, run, create batch records, do uh, the checks for sanitation after the, um, the operational day um, for that yeah, would be for food factories and, and uh, any industrial business that needs cleaning and sanitation. But for an industrial facility, it may be people doing quality control checks or writing how they're going to be done, people who oversee pre-shipment review, people who do uh, inspections. Um, those collections of tasks, again, if we have somebody who is the builder of the program and the leader, they're probably either going to do all of those things or will be directly involved in the handling of those events. But beyond that, if we're moving away from creation and, and or running a quality assurance program, we can kind of go down and say, hey, I can pull someone from operations and just say, hey, for an hour at the end of the day, I want you to do any number of these other tasks and they would have a quality assurance role. That could be being an inspector. So walking around. Now, if you've ever listened to any of our videos at the Kellerman Consulting website, if you've ever been to any of my webinars, you have heard me talk about the fact that I am 
fanatical about the concept that quality assurance means walking around the facility during the day. And that is a task that a QA person, someone who has a quality assurance role should be doing, walking around, inspecting how things are going and making note of it. So that would be those um, sort of walkthroughs. There are operational records reviews that are uh, checking that batch records or production runs are done correctly. Then we have our management review process. A quality assurance person may run that. Certainly, if you're one of the things we spoke about at the beginning of this slide, the person who created a program and is running it, probably going to run senior management meetings or management review, or at least participate in them. And then lastly, we have our internal audits. If you are responsible for uh, internal audits and doing corrective action, preventive action work, those are quality assurance roles, the main ones we think about. I do want to quickly say here that depending on the nature of industry, um, specifically those that have a responsibility to the government, and for this I'm thinking specifically of like medical device companies, pharmaceutical companies, dietary supplements in food, um, they often the expectation or and or the requirement is that there is a quality assurance department and it is independent of operations. So where it's required, that is expected there will be a QA manager that is independent of the operational manager. In those industries, there are major concerns that there will be doctoring of records or inauthenticity if operations is left to um, stop the line if there's a mistake. So QA has to be somewhat separate of that so that there's a, a sharing of power and that the QA manager can either uh, throw things away that are out of spec or stop a line if they see something that is inappropriate. Okay, so with that as context, we have some other roles I want everyone to be thinking about besides these main roles we just talked about, the regular QA roles. Um, if you have a laboratory in your business, that laboratory is probably under the purview of QA. Uh, however, and this is again, when we think about who might be the QA manager, sometimes we just have lab managers who have the QA responsibilities we just talked about. So a lab manager may run a lab and then have to go out onto the floor separately and do QA work. Um, that's not an uncommon um, arrangement, again, in dietary supplements or in businesses in which having a laboratory makes a lot of sense. Um, and food factories, some do have that. Labs are very expensive to start, so not very many uh, businesses starting up have laboratories. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I see Phoebe typed in. I, I blew it on this one. We have a chat function on this, and if you are listening to me and you want to ask a question, I will stop and I will answer those questions. Um, and I do love it when people do that. So if you will, um, it, it would be a, uh, a positive here. So please keep that in mind. Um, jumping back to this, separate of the labs, um, here I mentioned this conformance review, pre-shipment review that is something that may happen in um, a factory. Now, granted, if you are a meat and poultry facility, if you're under FSIS, you have to do pre-shipment checks as part of the FSIS process. Um, if you are a PCQI and an FDA regulated facility, then you have seven days to get that done after production. So generally, pre-shipment review is more or less a requirement. And depending on uh, your certification level, you are allowed to do those things. But again, in a business in which that's maybe a little more vague, somebody who has just a knowledge of what they're looking at when they review documentation is allowed to be that pre-shipment reviewer. Um, beyond that, beyond those tasks, I mentioned here training. So overseeing the training program. This one's real important because uh, much like quality assurance, human resources is another department, and I say that sort of in quotation marks, that kind of doesn't exist in a lot of businesses. You have HR responsibilities and obligations. You have to meet your um, documentation, taxation, hiring processes, managing of contractors. All those things are human resources. However, you may not have a HR person. Between HR and QA, who manages trainings is very different between, uh, between one business and another. 
So sometimes we find HR manages trainings and does all the hirings and things like that. And other times QA will actually have that responsibility and sort of um, maybe there's an accountant or an office manager that does those functions and, and sort of they are worked with. Um, there is the entirety of the supplier approval program. Um, that's something that is often liaisoned with a um, supply chain or a procurement person. So whether QA has that function or it's managed by a different department and quality assurance or the person who is the quality assurance person checks off on that, um, that varies dramatically across businesses. Um, the last thing I'll say is this managing of a certification program. If you have uh, SQF or BRCGS or ISO 9001, um, a GMP or a CGMP or dietary supplements, a QA person may have to run that program. Any of you who have ever dealt with those things knows it's very, very clearly defined uh, who gets to run those programs. So you, that one is a little more like to like across all businesses. Okay, so we kind of started here by framing the notion of like there are normal quality assurance roles, there's tack on stuff. And by the time we're done thinking about these things, perhaps after I've listed all of that to you, you're thinking, well, that's a whole job and that's my job, in which case you're a QA manager, great, a QA director. Um, however, you may realize actually and this is kind of split between three or four different people at a company that i worked at and it's it, it wasn't all that clear people called themselves qa managers and maybe didn't have all those functions and i, I it isn't what i thought um it, that would be normal and that's what we see and that is what i would think is expected but at the end of the day i've put here getting to 2040 hours as i've named this slide 2040 hours is approximately in america a full-time job that's someone who gets a week of vacation, but is otherwise working 40 hours a week um, throughout the year. So that's usually 2080 or 2040 is like the sort of standard amount of work that a, an adult is going to have in the workforce. So thinking through that full time job, what does it mean to carve this out to give someone a full time job? Because if we have a QA manager, that's got to be somebody who I would assume if you're going to pay for a, uh, a the going wage of someone to be a quality assurance manager, you're going to want to utilize them to their best abilities. And what I want to start working with here for the remainder of this presentation is to help you think through, like, do I need a QA manager? Do I need a dedicated QA person? Do I want to spread this out the the uh, not have one full-time person, but rather take this number of hours that one person might fulfill and spread it out across other people in the business and, and that where that's more appropriate, that's a, a totally understandable approach. So as we are thinking about how do we build up to this full-time job for quality assurance, we wanna think about what we're going to be pulling away from other departments, what roles need to be housed in that quality assurance role. So the first place to think about is the laboratory and operations, um, uh, any kind of sampling. So if you're not a food factory, if you're just an industrial facility, if there are lab activities, measurements, analytical uh, devices that are used to do measurements, quality assurance generally is gonna be, as I mentioned, linked with a laboratory. So if you have that, that's the first place to think about. Do I have uh, a large amount of time that I need to devote every week to getting those roles done? Is there so much that I need lab technicians and someone to oversee them? Or is the role someone that's going to go over to a station, whether it's in a housed laboratory in the building or just a cart somewhere that has a moisture device or um, a Zon cup for measuring viscosity or something like that? Um, if I have just a little bit of, of those tasks, I may not need a, a whole dedicated person. It may just be an operations person to do it. Um, so I would start with production and laboratory. So again, uh, for production, it might be an operator that works half the day on the line and then pulls back the second half of the day and does checks. Now, for anybody who is listening to this who has experience with quality assurance, I wanna make sure that you know that I know a little bit about what I'm talking about when I tell you that if an operator is gonna do that, they are not allowed to check their own work. 
So if we were not going to have a dedicated person and we were going to pull someone from the line to do a records check, they cannot check the work on the line they were on. And however, you could have take multiple people off different lines or totally unrelated tasks and have them look. So for example, a maintenance employee can do a records check for operations, but that maintenance employee could not do a records check of maintenance that was done if they did it, or if a close colleague did it is usually sort of the dividing line. Okay, so we're moving on. We got our operations and we have our lab activities. Let's talk about procurement because if we have a supply chain program, and if it's a complex supply chain program, if we have multiple suppliers that we buy from and we buy a bunch of materials and we have a relatively complicated program, as would be required in a certification scheme, we have to get documents from those folks. We have to check certificates of conformance, certificates of analysis, certificates of testing, whatever we want to call those for the things that come in the door. And we have to uh, usually maybe liaison and purchase those things ourselves. And that takes a lot of time. Anybody who has ever spent time doing document chasing for suppliers knows that, oh man, some of them take forever. They don't respond to those emails. If you do not follow up with them, you're not going to get those documents and your supply chain program is going to have massive gaps in it. And depending again on how complicated supplier approval interactions are, that might be a full-time job itself. So we may have a supply chain person. Procurement may handle those things or may not, depending on how complicated they are. Um, and to go with that, we have R&D in certain companies that are, are design and development businesses and the sort of uh, need to manage taking things from the R&D or the bench top into full production if those tasks require document creation. So if we need to make new batch records, if we have to constantly add things into our pre-existing program or make new documents, that is going to have heavily factor into how much time it takes to get document creation done. Again, all of the things I've mentioned here could be the role of one person or a, pers a group of people with a manager, but it could be people from uh, elsewhere in the in the company swooping in to take these responsibilities. There is no right or wrong way. There is no pre-subscribed notion. As I mentioned, uh, you cannot check your own work. That's a huge deal. Um, and so generally, you cannot have a business of one. That's, that is usually the dividing line we tell people is you cannot be a sole proprietor in a factory. There needs to be two people because a person does a task and someone checks them is, is usually the minimum. As you enter into what is quality assurance, though, obviously, like we're talking about here, it, it gets uh, sort of murky. Um, continuing on, because there's a lot more here that can be considered into that, into the tasks to make that full-time job. Again, training in HR. If a QA person is going to be managing those documents and making sure that we have the correct um, training records for all the employees, possibly have responsibility for hiring. Um, that is pretty common in QA departments that have QA managers that they kind of have to hire their own people or at least take a huge role in the selection and hiring process. That may take a huge chunk of hours um, to go along with QA work. Um, and then we also have to think about, has that QA person been given leadership at the company? I mentioned at the beginning, the owner of the business can be the, the president, the plant manager can have QA responsibilities, provided they don't check their own work. Um, but if someone's going to have a leadership role, if you have a good QA manager, odds are that person is very much worth keeping and might be a great person to have up at the higher levels in the leadership and strategy sessions. Where that's the case where you actually have a really a strong person that you've identified to take it back to our previous webinars. If you've hired well, if you've elevated someone and you realize you've got a real gem of an employee and, and we want to see how high up they can get, those additional leadership roles are going to heavily complicate the ability to get all of these other QA tasks done. I can tell you that if I'm going to be made a QA manager and I'm going to be a big shot at a company and I'm told that I got to go get supplier approval documents to go along with that, I may just be a little offended 
because I'm a big important person and I'm I'm leadership and you want me to go do these menial tasks? I got to go check documents and and track down supplier, you know, uh, allergen statements or you know specifications. That really does start to get into personality issues here on top of do I just have the right amount of work for the tasks you know in a given week or in a given year I do want to say we are going to get into power dynamics as part of this discussion because I think it's very important um, when we talk about QA and especially if we're gonna zero in on the idea of QA managers or QA directors um, what that actually looks like um, so lastly, if we have this certification or customer requirements, a lot of times those are, they, they may not be huge in a year, but in any given week, meeting customer expectations or performing certification tasks adds into that yearly bucket of tasks that they're going to have. So as we've looked at the, the last slide in this one, you can already see, I mean, you're, you may be listening to me and your heart may be racing, just thinking about all these things that have to get done. And that for a lot of businesses is way more than one person's job. That might be two or three people, in which case now we're talking about getting to that 6,000 or 8,000 hours of tasks in which many people have full-time jobs. But for a lot of the business we, businesses we work with, because quality assurance as a uh, ethos or as a ta set of tasks, it was defined many years ago and someone just has this role and it gets built around a personality rather than uh, a real coherent sort of uh, separation of tasks and separation of responsibilities and trying to plug in the best people into those roles. And so quality assurance just becomes this sort of, well, it's what this guy has done in the past. And we just, once that person retires, we just need to fill that and have someone do it exactly the same way. I really want anyone listening to this to feel empowered, to take a step back and think through what are the actual tasks that are important to each job and how that might build out this um, idea of what quality assurance is. And I do want to lastly say on this, I know I said lastly for the certifications and customer requirements, but depending on the level of risk and the level of safety in what a company does often really drives that basic notion of how important it is to have a QA manager, a dedicated person. If we have a product that carries a very high risk, whether that's a hazardous chemical for an industrial facility or um, a, a finicky electronic device. For food factories, of course, if you're making ready to eat products, then the complexity of a safety program is so significant that you really need to have a quality assurance person, a dedicated person managing those processes or else you know, there could be huge risks to our employees or to the people that utilize what we make in a facility. So as we closely or more um, intensely drill into this way of thinking of this bucket of tasks, I wanna go back and divide between scheduled activities and meetings because we've listed a bunch of things in, as part of this webinar of jobs and tasks that can be done, but we can actually break this down a little further and get, get clarity as to, okay, I want to draw a schedule for what a, what a QA person, tech or manager at my company will do. Um, and the, one of the best ways to think about that are, okay, I can actually schedule out a bunch of these tasks now, and as I think through my schedule, it's going to be very apparent how, how complex those tasks are. And then in the next slide, we're going to look at meetings. And between the scheduled activities and the meetings, we really can think about how much free time someone's actually going to have in between their tasks. And it will help us concept conceptualize how close we're going to get to that 2,000 or so hours of a full-time job. So when we think about scheduled activities, I don't want to be focused on a calendar. So we're not talking about February 16th getting um, a, a piece of equipment fixed 
or cleaning. When we talk about scheduled activities, we're really only speaking in generic terms of the frequency of whether something is daily or hourly, whether it's once a week, once a month, once a year, or as needed. Um, as needed, of course, is difficult to schedule, somewhat the opposite of scheduling, but we may have as needed tasks that we know will be done sometime throughout the year, but we may not understand a set frequency. Um, the first and foremost, production, and I will throw in laboratory uh, as, as we continue that discussion for this webinar, uh, those obviously are the most important scheduled activities we need to run. And if, if we have a lab, we need to be testing the stuff we run. And that's how we're going to make some money uh, as a business. So we start with that. If we have a dedicated quality person, then they're probably not going to be doing production. However, if we are only going to run three days a week, that may influence how many people are even in a building or in a workspace throughout the week. And quality assurance may or may not have uh, set functions in days where there is no operation. To go along with production, we have cleaning and sanitizing, and that might just be clean up in an industrial facility. It might be running a floor cleaner or Zamboni. It may just be sweeping up or mopping. Or in complex operations like food facilities, we're really going to be talking about actually applying cleaner and sanitizer after a production run. So we are going to have to schedule those activities as well. And we're going to be thinking about how often those things have to be checked. Obviously a QA person is probably not gonna be doing the cleaning and sanitizing, but if the checks of that cleaning and sanitizing um, are a key function of our job and re uh, re are a reoccurring task, then that needs to be factored into um, the scheduled activities. Maintenance, similarly, uh, with maintenance, obviously usually we have dedicated maintenance people, but checking off of maintenance reports or scheduled maintenance or preventive maintenance. Those things take up some time um, and need to be factored in certainly throughout, as I say, a, a year. Uh, we're going to need to have those things come back to. And I can tell you that when it comes to preventive maintenance, it is a very easy part of the job to sort of uh, fall through the cracks. Um, not so much the actual maintenance itself, but going around and checking up on preventive maintenance. So those are the three, I would say, the main buckets that production, cleaning, and sanitation, and uh, maintenance. Beyond that, we have our audit schedules. So if we're going to pursue um, certification schemes or if we have our own internal audits, um, whether that's required or not, those scheduled events how long it's going to take us to do those audits to whether it's again a certification audit that we're going to have to sit through for multiple days whether we have complex programs that require internal auditing maybe we have to develop that internal audit ourselves so the amount of time that's going to take but then the functional aspects of doing an internal audit um, that's usually multiple days that have to be thought through I'm throwing in here culture of safety and quality. This is one that is uh, obviously uh, been a touch point in industry now for several years. I would say most businesses are well established on having some kind of assessment of a culture of safety and quality. There should be that in place and depending on how elaborate a culture of safety and quality um, tasks are, and the assessment of the effectiveness of those tasks, that can be a pretty significant uh, part of someone's job responsibilities. If we're going to have office gatherings, luncheons, if we're going to have uh, celebrations, if we're going to go out on the line and talk about issues that are coming up as part of our culture, that really can, can take many, many hours of planning and actualizing as a, as a big part of a scheduled activity. And then lastly, the management review, which gets at the overview of all of these things. And so management review, whether that's an hour once a month, whether that's multiple day meeting once a year or some kind of hybrid in between, the actual carving out of time to do it correctly um, to get a functional management meeting needs to be thought through in this bucket of quality assurance work. Um, the the notion here of again we have not said we have to have a qa manager we can divide this up the 
maintenance schedule, the cleaning schedule, the supervisors of those things could theoretically work together to take care of some of that quality assurance work to make sure that all the documentation is there. Um, there is, again, no notion this has to be a QA manager. So in contrast to those scheduled events, now we did talk about management review meetings, but we have other meetings that have to be factored into a mature operations in a factory, industrial or food. Um, and the first and foremost of that are going to be improvement meetings. I, I can tell you that when I go on site to facilities, I frequently see first and foremost the events in which the facility is trying to make improvements to their to their operations, but they do not have any meetings about it. They are not documenting those things and those end up getting lost in the shuffle when an inspection occurs or when there's a certification audit. Um, there should be time set aside, whether that's once a month, it could be more than once a month if there's lots of projects, may only be a couple times a year. But there should be some kinds of meetings that are taking place where we review what improvements are being made, check up on them, make sure that these things are, are being done correctly. I know many of you are probably going to uh, think through towards production meetings. Um, a lot of times improvements and repairs, things like that, are, are just mentioned in daily production meetings. Um, I wouldn't really describe that as quality assurance work. I would say that's much closer aligned with operations. And I do think there should be a quality assurance type assessment of improvements. Um, to go along with improvement meetings, we obviously have our trainings. Um, those really are, I, I think of them as meetings. You're going to get people together. Um, anyone who has ever had to run a training program knows how incredibly difficult it is to get everyone together to do those trainings. As soon as you start thinking through, um, am I going to get all of the people in operations together in one sit, or am I going to have to break it up if I have multiple shifts, or if I have people that are going to be sick and that happens regularly, um, you know, it's probably not one training, it's probably a bunch for each type of uh, training we're going to do. So if we have multiple topics that we break up, there may be two or three goes at each of those, and that can spread out in any myriad number of ways um, across a year. Um, for the last three things here are gonna be um, uh, most closely aligned with food facilities. Um, however, all industrial facilities may have um, some, of, some combination of, of these tasks. We have our safety and quality team meetings that have to be done in which we're just gonna review the safety and quality programs themselves. So if you have a HACCP team in a food factory or a preventive controls food safety team, they're gonna sit down and only focus on the application of the food safety plan. Is it working? Are our checks working? Do we have problems that are coming up? Customer complaints, things like that, violations. Uh, recall, defense and fraud. Recall is obviously a requirement in the food industry. It may not be um, a requirement in other industries. However, if we have a recall team, they need to have a meeting. A food defense or a security team needs to meet. The fraud team needs to meet. And we need to make sure we have time for all of those things. The emergency team, crisis management team, or just regular safety and emergency, um, whether that's OHAS or um, OSHA uh, designations within a facility, those teams should be meeting as well. I mean, feels like we've already talked about multiple people's full-time jobs just going through all these tasks. But again, some of them may be lighter or less work in some facilities and, and determining what that mix really is and, and how we're going to build out a full QA job. Um, again, so different from one business to the next. So as we move towards uh, the latter part of this webinar, I do want to talk about a couple of incredibly important issues here, which are structural and, in this case, political. Um, I want to talk about what I mean by politics. Obviously, we are not talking about the unnecessary conversations at the, at the water cooler about uh, politics uh, locally or federally. We don't care about that. We do want to talk about the politics within an organization, because if we're thinking about how our quality assurance team runs or what the mix of people who do quality assurance work is. Politics is inseparable from that. There always will be politics. And that often determines 
how we set up a QA um, arrangement in a facility. And I want to quickly say here, when we're talking about policy and politics, that are, those are the two major functions in any structure when it comes to the arrangement of how things work and the power that goes with it. Policies are how we function, right? So a supplier, supplier approval program is a policy. Uh, the cleaning and, and sanitation, the way we do it are the policies we set, the hygiene standards that we keep. Politics is the application of power. So when I have authority and I go to use it, I am practicing politics and I do not care if there is a coherent uh, economic or sociological principle there. If I tell someone to do something and they have to do it, there is a political dynamic there. There is a power dynamic. And, and as all of you who are listening know, that is inseparable from your job. Um, and how we think through who is going to have these roles, if you are going to establish a QA role in a business, they have power. They can stop the line. They can hold product. They can write someone up, choose which non-conformances they're going to emphasize, choose what customer complaints are going to be assigned to who uh, the guilty party is. And whether people want to acknowledge that or do not want to acknowledge it, it is a fundamental reality in a quality assurance department. If we have a QA manager, you really are concentrating power into one person. If we spread it out across multiple people, you may diffuse some of that power and authority, but it is still there. And m m almost anyone who's worked in a, in a factory has been in an uncomfortable situation in which people who have leadership roles, whether it's operations and quality or senior management and quality are fighting over power, uh, you know, whether or not product is gonna be released whether someone's going to get promoted or fired, things like that. And QA often is a power center and a source of that in a company, even if the person who has that may not get paid very much and may not have a fancy title. So keep that in mind. Really, I would say, honestly, if there's only one takeaway of this webinar, it's that think through QA as that power dynamic, because I bet it'll explain a lot about how your business or the organization you work in functions, if you are going into a new organization, looking for and thinking through how that power dynamic functions in that business will, as much as any potential definition of quality assurance, will drive us towards understanding the role, the distribution of responsibilities and roles. Um, so that's a huge part of, of the structure of a business. And again, how, how much QA is the center of a business or not. And with that, I want to talk about the difference between a QA manager and a director of quality assurance. This is something that comes up regularly. Um, I was gonna, I was thinking about like quizzing everyone, what's the difference between a manager and a director, but I will tell you now, um, there is really no difference between a quality assurance manager and a director of quality assurance. This is a issue I wanted to talk about because people think of them differently. And certainly people who are given title of director will often act in a different way than someone who has been given the title of quality assurance manager, even though there is functionally no distinction here. What if, if, if we are thinking about a quality assurance task, so we take all of the roles, meetings, schedules, all the stuff we've talked about, and we are building out a job function, and we need to have more than one person that completes those tasks, and we want to make a department for quality assurance, obviously, the person who is the senior most member of that, the person with the most responsibility, is probably going to be a quality assurance manager. In some organizations, you have a very cheap ability. So instead of giving someone a financial raise, you can just say, I'm going to give you a title raise um, to make them feel better or to build morale. Great. And that, that's fine if that's a choice that's made. But a director level position, especially in a smaller organization, may just be a manager. And what for my mind, someone who is a quality assurance manager is the person who is ultimately going around and making sure 
that tasks that need to be delegated are delegated properly and that there is follow-up and oversight of those delegated tasks and anything that has to be written down, that's a manager. But a director really does the same thing. It's just a matter of if there needs to be more than one manager, then okay, now we may need to have uh, a distinction above them. Certainly if I have a quality control department that is separate from a quality assurance department, and I want to have a director of quality or that oversees both, that's a, an example of an organization that might be making a choice to make someone a director rather than a manager. But I can tell you that what I see in organizations is the sort of haphazard application and uh, the throwing around of these titles. And I will say that I have heard and I do see it from time to time, people who are quality directors that feel that they do not need to participate in the actual quality work, that they see themselves as higher level overseers and are removed from those things, removed from doing audits, removed from doing walkthroughs, removed from doing um, reviews of records and, and, and removed from actually observing cleaning and sanitation. And I have to tell you that I fundamentally disagree with anyone who takes the position of I am too high up to participate and at least observe these things happening. And so I tend to be on the side of QA techs and QA managers as far more important than QA directors. But to reference the politics and the power dynamic, someone who is given a director level role has an incredible influence on the mechanisms of a department, how things work. And the, all those QA tasks, who does them, who is rewarded and punished and things like that, that director level position usually is the person that people are most afraid of. And if that person also takes the position that they are going to be 10 steps away from the what goes on in quality assurance, they're probably not doing a whole lot of actual quality assurance work. And at the end of the day or week or year or whatever, I am a believer that with quality assurance, physically being present, actually being engaged, looking at the documents, thinking through if the records make sense, thinking through improvements, following up on non-conformances, those things are really what quality assurance is. And when those are done correctly in a business, you will generally find an incredibly well-run business. And so if you have someone at a high level role in a company and they don't have the proper accountability that, to, that they are being held to, uh, and in quality assurance, it's not uncommon to see people who are at this very high levels of QA that are not really being held accountable because no one really knows what they do. Because quality assurance, we've talked about this in previous webinars is a very technically complex role. And so the person who may be up high, maybe they've got fancy designations and maybe they're very highly educated or a doctor or something like that. And no one wants to challenge them. But in this distinction of QA manager versus director, you see a, you, have, you see so much of the character of how an organization is put together and how those QA tasks are put together. The very last thing that we're going to talk about in the last few minutes before I bring Evan back up. So we talked about now building out a entire QA department, but the last piece of it is if we are going to have to do a certification program. And so many businesses now, that's a fundamental part of the actual ability to attract clients is to get that certification. They won't even talk to you if you're not ISO certified or if you're SQ, if you're not SQF certified or BRCGS. So that's something that has to be factored in. And, and this is a huge difficulty. And it's something that we share with our clients is that if you're going to have a certification program, maybe ISO might be less than this number, but if you're gonna, if you're a food factory and you have to get GFSI certified, that's gonna be about a thousand hours separate of what we've talked about here. And the task list is down on this slide, the things to consider. Those supplier documents change at that level. The management review meetings are now required and they and they have to discuss the functioning of that program, which adds time. 
The internal audit has to be against the scheme that uh, you are certified to, and that is a complex action above and beyond any other internal audits that are done. The types of defense assessments, fraud assessments, that culture, those things are no longer potentially optional or they are not necessarily allowed to be shrunk down programs. They now have to be built out to the scheme. And the easy rule of thumb here is that you have whatever your QA roles, whatever quality assurance or quality control rules must be done as part of normal operations. Now we're going to add a thousand hours. So if you're lucky, and you only have a thousand hours of quality assurance work based on the original stuff we talked about and you wanted to add a certification program possibly one person can just take on that responsibility and be an sqf practitioner along with the qa work but if you have an employee who is a full-time employee and you are you get that dreaded phone call or email from an existing supplier or someone who wants to buy from you, I'm sorry, or, or a customer, a potential customer or an existing customer to get that dreaded call that says, oh, we need you to get a certification here going forward. You're probably going to need to think through another thousand hours and who is that gonna be distributed to in order to run a program. If I need to put that thousand hours on a person who's already got QA responsibilities, how are we going to free them up from some of the other tasks that they were doing so that they have time to now address all of the certification requirements in addition to the other things that may need to be done on the day to day. So that right there is our presentation today. I hope that it got some minds spinning and uh, sparks some reassessment of your own um, operation. I do want to say we have one more webinar to sort of cap this entire series off, which is the retaining and elevating of employees. We're going to talk about how to do performance evaluations and how to uh, move people up and keep them valuable in your program. That's going to be next month in March. With that said, we brought Evan back up. If anybody has any questions for either of us that they would like addressed before we go, we can give folks a few minutes. As I did last time, we're not going to wait too long. Um, oh, we do have one. All right. Kim asks, does a typical HACCP chairman's role require about a thousand hours separate as well? A HACCP, I assume here, Kim, we're talking about a HACCP team lead. I really think of that within the build out of the normal quality program. If you have a HACCP program, as part of a food factory, that is a regulatory requirement. You really can't run without that. And so that may or may not, it's, it's much more difficult to give that a fixed definition because again, if you folks are, let's say a aseptic operation or a low acid canning operation or an acidified foods, ready to eat, anything like that, the HACCP team lead may have 2000 hours worth of work to do um, going around and, and certifying all the products were made correctly, signing off on them. Um, certainly all of the meetings that we talked about, running the HACCP team, doing recall checks, uh, you know, doing mock recalls, food defense, allergen stuff, all the trainings that go with it, it, it a thousand hours minimum. I would say probably if you have a, a complex organization, your HACCP leads probably a 2000 hours a year job. Did that answer your question? We'll see if we may or may not get a response on that. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Perfect. Olivia asks, oh, says, thank you for the information. Um, this is why uh, Olivia is one of our clients who we're very lucky to work with. Um, we actually have kind of combined multiple programs and we have started to work on fixing up things, the meetings so that multiple actions can get done at once. That is a very complex setup. It, uh, I can tell you that for that company, they are an extremely well-run company and capable of, of starting to combine everything, which is ultimately the ideal um, when that's possible. Um, and we love to see when, when folks are capable of that. Is there anyone else with some feedback or questions that they would like to address? Give me about another 30 seconds or so. 
And again, if anybody needs or wants yep. connected exactly. to their MEP centers, please feel free to reach out to me um, or the Kelvin team. They can they can direct your you to me as well. Um, but yeah, there's tons and tons of resources, grant resources, all sorts of different things that we, the MEP centers can do to help you uh, to grow. So we hope that you guys will reach out to us. And thank you again to the Kellerman team. This is fantastic. Pleasure. Thanks, folks. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and week. Uh, we hope to see you next month. And we hope this was uh, informative and helpful. Take care.